Wellspring Church of All Nations presents Screams in the Desert, hosted by Pastors George and Sharon Stoke. dynamic Las Vegas couple bring the life-changing Word of God alive through anointed prophetic ministry. Their teaching causes mountain-moving faith to bring the victory of God's love to bear on the everyday issues of life. Join George and Sharon now as they share with you the secrets and joys of a fulfilling, abundant, spirit-filled, and spirit-led life. Building relationships. Good. Yeah, relationships are everything. I said relationships are everything, and uh, we've, we've, we've got to just focus, and we're going to focus this year on building relationships, and uh, I don't know what that'll look like, but we'll do it, amen, hallelujah. I, when I was talking to somebody, who was it? Oh, Brother James back there on the camera, he would say, well, you know, I was an only child, and I, you know, I wasn't real big on relationships, and I gave him a high five, because that was me. Hallelujah. Only child, spoiled rotten. <laughs> I can't even imagine what it'd be like to have a little brother. It was just, oh boy, I'll tell you, want to play with all my toys, I'd have a rough time. I'd probably learn to share sooner. <laughs> Relationships, it's good though. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Oh, I'll tell you, whoo, what would we do? What would we do without Jesus? Well, I remember, unfortunately. I still remember what you do without Jesus, and that's not a good deal. But you know what, what is so magnificent, so amazing, so awesome is that God wanted a relationship with humanity, with mankind, and had a plan to restore what he knew would be the fall. You know, that. Adam's and Eve's fall was no surprise to God. He knew it was coming, but he gave him a crack at it anyway. He gave him a chance. That's what I love about God. There, we have no past. We only have a future. Huh? And he put all of that behind him set in motion a plan to bring us back to him in relationship by sending his only begotten son. I still having a hard time wrapping my head and my heart around that, how God, while we were his enemies, while we were sinners, a holy God wanted us, wanted relationship with us, had a plan and a purpose for us. His whole, his whole uh, eternal plan was wrapped around and included us. And he sent Jesus. And Jesus came willingly. And he knew what he was getting. I said he knew what he was getting. I'm like David. I said, what, what in the world am I? that God would even take notice. And then, because he wanted to make me after his own kind, a little lower than Elohim, wow. Adopted each of us into his family. It fit absolutely phenomenal. I'm a, I want to read I want to read Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 6. Talk to you a little bit. Sharon and I talked to you a little bit about relationship and the eternal purpose of God, which is to have relationship with you and I. Not as something way off that we will have, but something he wants us to have beginning now that will last for eternity. Ephesians chapter 2. 
verse 1, you have he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespass and sin. When in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now works, still works, in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by very nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, I like that, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sin, has quickened us together with Christ by grace you're saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He has raised us, you and I, up together. We didn't get raised up alone as only children. He wants us to be in relationship with each other. And he wants us, both individually and collectively, to be in relationship with him. He raised us up together. Did you see that? In him. And he made us sit together. And some of us were still going, he touched me. You know how kids would be in the back seat? Daddy, he touched me. He looked at me. He looked at me. <laughs> Johnny's spitting on me. <laughs> huh? You know how that can be. And God said, yeah, I'm, I want you to get used to each other. I want you to begin to learn how to get along with each other. You're seated together, and he's making us sit together. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, Americans are funny. I mean, we got people over here, and there's seats in here. There's seats in here. We got people back there. I mean, we even have, there's probably somebody out there sitting out there right, watching on the screen. I don't know. It's crazy. We're Americans. If we were in China, everybody would be in the front row. I mean, everybody just all smooshed and squished together. It's a cultural thing. We like our space. It's funny. You know, so somebody said, how, how, many, how many Asians can you get in a Hyundai? And they said, it's me. As many are going where you're going. <laughs> you know, it's unbelievable if you've ever been in the Philippines, how many people get in, in, on, and around a jeepney. You know, you don't just sit in the car with a seat belt. We're civilized. Ha ha. I mean, they got them hanging on the fenders, sitting on the fenders, hanging on the roof, sitting on the roof. I mean, they're everywhere. They're people everywhere, and they're all smooshed together inside. You don't hear anybody saying, he touched me. That's just the way it is. It's only Americans we're sitting there with. <laughs> feeling uncomfortable, made us sit together. Where? In a place that's foreign to us, but shouldn't be. He wants us, you and I, to get used to being together, together in Christ in the heavenlies. Sharon and I have been, we, we've, we've just, we've, I don't know what, we've been at it about a month now, I guess. And we're just trying to hang out with God and just quit doing and just be. And uh, because we realize that there's a lot of things we know but that we're not experiencing. There's a lot of things the church knows, but it's not experiencing. What, what would the world do if the church began to demonstrate what it knows? So, here we are in, in the heavenlies. He made us sit together in the heavenlies at the right hand of God in Christ. 
What God, God, I believe God wants us to do, he says, I brought you up, I set you down next to me in my dear son. I want to begin to develop a relationship with you, not based on what you know down on the world, but based upon what, where you and I are right now. In the throne room. Where everything, everything, is really controlled. Where everything is held together. Where the eternal plans and purposes of God are being revealed just like lightning flashes moment by moment. That, that'll change church. I mean, church will just be a whole new thing. I believe that's where God wants to take us because we're just about to break into the greatest worldwide revival the world has ever seen. And the church needs to be ready for it, to lead people not back into the, you know, more knowledge and, and more stuff, and, but lead them right into the presence of Almighty God and activate them to reach the rest of the world. When we talk about being raised up, we talk about relationship, it reminds me of being raised up in the family. Now, I did have a brother, but I was the oldest. But I did have a sibling. And being raised up together is growing up together. We grow up together. I had cousins and all uncles and all that stuff. We, were, we grew up together, like we grew up together. And uh, not only does God say he's going to put us together in the body of Christ, but he's going to raise us up together. So we're going to grow up together. But then he comes in uh, 6 and he uses the word raise us up together and make us sit down in heavenly places. So that speaks of elevation, doesn't it? So that's like being resurrected or being raised up in resurrection to heaven. Uh, Paul said it once. He said, Oh, that I might be uh, experience the resurrection from the uh, from the body while still in the body. Mm -hmm. So there must be a way to go to heaven while still in the body, but not in the body. You understand what I'm saying? And so there's a, a resurrection that if we were if we died in Christ, then we if we are risen in Christ, well, we have already been resurrected, haven't we? We have life in Christ. We died in him we are risen in him so we are resurrected so resurrected people really would live their lives in the kingdom of heaven right where the Lord is although we're on the earth we're not of the earth we, we heard uh, Bill Johnson yesterday and he was saying he pointed out how Jesus was was on the earth and he said how that 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 he had actually been ascended. Asc he ascended. How, he, he who had, had ascended has also descended. And yet that was before he, the, his resurrection. He was still here in the body. And yet he was saying, I've been to heaven and back while I'm here. And, and we, you know, we could wonder, he made the comment, I wonder, I, I don't know if that was, it, you know, was this an out of the body of experience or was this, did he go physically? And, and that's really not important. What's important is that prior to his, to his glorification, his transfiguration, all of that, he, he actually went to heaven. Which really is, is, goes, is what she's talking about. We should, we need to begin to to understand we're supposed to get what, at least get our heads in heaven while our bodies are on earth. To set our mind on, on, on the things in heaven. Yeah. I think for the Lord, it was easy for him to be in heaven and on earth at the same time. Relationship. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And we try and box things off to where we're here and we're waiting to go there when yet God has said that we are risen in Christ. So when once we're born again, there is a new dimension that we dwell in. There's a new place that we live in. And we need to be able to experience that place. 
and uh, yes, getting raised up on earth together is a, it's a developmental thing, isn't it? We have to learn to get along. We learn to get to yield to one another. We learn to um, think the best of one another, to watch what we're saying about one another and to one another. We talked about that in the women's meeting yesterday, which was a great meeting. And, uh, but to be risen with him and, and to be uh, seated together in heavenly places, uh, can you, what, what do you see if you close your eyes and imagine yourself in heaven? I mean, we probably all see a different heaven, maybe, but it doesn't matter because I think when we're in heaven, it looks different to each one of us. It's just like when you go to the Grand Canyon and everybody looks out over the Grand Canyon, we all see something different, don't we? I mean, somebody else is captivated by the bottom. Somebody likes the other edge, right? <laughs> we all see differently. Mm -hmm. But when we were raised up together, seated with him in the heavenlies at the right hand of God in Christ, everything else should look different to us here where we dwell. So we should have a more heavenly per perspective. Yeah, our, our view should be from where we are. And if we, if what we tend to do is we see everything from where we are physically, where we are in our circumstance and situation, instead of seeing from where we are, which, which is in the heavenlies, which is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Now, it's not something we're waiting for. Every, everything in the New Testament tells us that we are there now, that Jesus took us there now, that he, he could, he, in him, this is all already taken place. It's not something we're waiting to do. The thing is that we, we've rejoiced in the knowledge of that, but we've not walked in the experience of that because we really don't quite know what to do with that. And yet, uh, this, this, it all happens, this access comes by the same one and the same Spirit. We all have the Holy Spirit. We, again, we are together in this thing. And God is endeavoring to, to download, if you will, to us a supernatural understanding that will call us Higher, call us to where we're supposed to be. See, right, right now the world looks just, I mean, the church looks just like the world. Our divorce rate's just as high. Our booze rate, boozing rate and, and drug rate is just as high. I mean, everything is just as high. We are no different from the world because for so long we've, had, we've been loaded with knowledge, but we've not been loaded with experience. And God says, now I'm, I'm peeling back the veil and I want, you, I, want you to, to, I want the church to wake up and experience what has already been purchased in Christ. Amen. Amen. And it, once, once, we begin to, once we begin to understand that this is possible, we have the mind of Christ. We're positioned in Christ where we can talk to our Father in the throne room from a, and look at things with a heavenly perspective. Once we, we even consider that, we'll begin to go there. It's that vision thing again. You've got to see it before you'll go there. But if, once you begin to see it, and that's what revelation does, revelation opens your eyes, you see something, and then you want to go there. Well, that's what God wants. He wants us to go there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said he wants us to go there. <laughs> Y'all want to go there? Yeah. yeah. And we have access. We have access. This is a, something. You have access. You have the access key. You have the card that, that unlocks the door. You got all It's that one and same spirit. The Holy Ghost. We're not locked out. We don't have to just wander around down here like a bunch of chickens in the dust. We can actually lift off and soar like eagles because we have access. And the devil would like to talk you out of that, tell you you're not worthy. You can't, you're worthy in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> I don't know, everybody perfect yet here? 
besides me? No. <laughs> no way, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay? You understand. Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both... You know, that was talking about Jews and Jewish believers and, 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 and Gentile believers, but it's still, it's this together thing that God is bringing himself together, a people, a family. We both have access by one spirit, hallelujah, unto the Father. I have access with the Father. Oh, we say it. Oh, you have boldness to come, crying out to the throne of grace, throne of mercy, crying, Abba, Father. And we go, ah, glory to God. Isn't that wonderful? I can pray. And God will hear me. No, we can actually be with him. Woo! Huh? But it's a together thing, and it takes relationship because God is building us into a spiritual house. And that, by very nature, then if we're the living stones, the building blocks, He's got to position us together, and he fits. The scripture says that, that we are fitly framed. He brings together a particular people for a particular purpose. That's why you have different churches. I mean, we can say, well, I belong to the body of Christ. We do. But we also have been placed in his garden, in his vineyard, if you will, and in, in we've been positioned and planted in different congregations or different groupings to accomplish a specific purpose for him. And so the first thing he does is try and bring us into relationship with each other and with him so that we can catch a glimpse of what his divine plan and purpose is and then together begin to go in that direction. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And, and we're being built to, as a habitation for God. Verse 22, Ephesians 2. We're building together. Why? For a habitation of God. How? Through the Spirit. What does it look like if God lives in you, expresses himself in and through you, displays himself in and through you? We call it glory. <laughs> huh? but, but what will happen then? You're walking around and God is being God in and through you, in and through his church. I think a few people, a few more people would get healed. A few more people would get delivered. A few more people would get saved. Don't you? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> well, sometimes we feel like outcasts, but the scripture says we're not outcasts. Here in verse, verse 19. I mean, you can get involved in this because it says you're no longer outcasts. You're no longer exiles or aliens and excluded from the rights of citizens. You're not an illegal immigrant in heaven. You're not without citizenship. You, uh, you receive Christ and you become a citizen of heaven. You become part of the family of God. That's what draws all of us together from all different kind of backgrounds. And that's what can make it so frustrating in the church because everybody's so different that it just helps sandpaper off all those rough edges we have. If we'll allow God to work in our midst, if we'll keep a heavenly perspective, we realize that we belong to God's own household. And you do have to share. See there? Yeah, all the single, all the, the only children have to learn to share. Right. We have to learn to share in the kingdom of God because God shared his only son to us, right? It's not he my did. car, it's our car. <laughs> it's not my house, it's our house. True. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's not my church, it's our church. It's God's church. All of our churches. This is all our church, right? That's right. We have ownership. If we're part of the household, we have ownership, right? right. I mean, it's, uh, 
It's interesting. Yeah, I, remember. I, I think Vera took ownership. She, she did. I catch her every week running a vacuum around She's here. She's a blessing. That's ownership. Take ownership. Hallelujah. Ask not what your church can do for you, but ask what you can do for your church. <laughs> ownership. Amen. That sounds really that's good. Right, that's right. That's right. right. Yeah. Amen. But that's relationship too. Right. right. It's relationship. In fact, I know, I know one. I know one church. They have they have so many people that want to help clean that they have a they get together once a week and they have a devotional together and then they clean the house and of course many hands makes light work yeah so you know this might be something for you to work on we'll pray on that won't we <laughs> praise the lord we'll pray on that glory to god but it's a together thing it's a relationship thing you know e even the the men's breakfast we we're developing relationships and it's funny how many relationships are developed in the in the in the work party that's amazing really just you know you get a couple of guys working together and they get to sharing life together and i mean they forget they're working we've got to call them in for breakfast kind of like my mom she used to call me in for dinner because i'd be too engrossed out playing with my friends right but it's a together thing a relational thing it's a wonderful thing god is using all everything he can to bring us together to be a place where he lives. He wants you to fulfill your destiny in him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every one of us have a destiny in God. He wants us to fulfill that destiny in him. But the closer we can get to him, the easier it's going to be to fulfill that destiny, isn't it? The more we feel at home with God the Father and uh, we recognize that Jesus is our elder brother uh, change something it can change your life you got family if you never had a father you have a father in God and we have to learn that there's a difference there he is the greatest father there ever was he's the the picture of fatherhood all other fathers fall short of that because they're human fathers but we find our fulfillment of a father in God. He always does what he says. He never doesn't show up when he said he would show up. He always does what he said he would do. And it's a great thing. And we have an elder brother. What does that mean to me? Well, I don't have to fight all the battles myself and protect my younger brother, right? I can have someone who's going to take up for me. I have an elder brother who's going to take up for me. And I can say, did you see what they did to me? He just muscles out there, right? Amen. We each have an elder brother in Jesus Christ, the Lord. That's great when we face the devil. Amen. The devil's threatening us and, and, and trying to put fear in us and stuff. It's not but our fight. Then the, then the devil looks up over our head, and there's our elder brother standing there grinning at him, and he disappears. Yeah, there. amen. <laughs> yeah, we have all kinds of help we don't realize we have, amen. Yeah. We do. Lord. We have help. Yeah. To, to help us in time of trouble. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we need a, a, rela a greater relationship with the Lord, to love him more, that people can see how much we love the Lord. Do we ever just make over the Lord like we would make over a boyfriend or a girlfriend and go crazy over Jesus? Mm -hmm. Well, we did when we were first born again, but sometimes it just leaks out, right? We've got to get that fire burning again in us. To where we want to be in the presence of God. We want to bring our portion of the Spirit to where we have a relationship in the church that can bring us into heavenly places together. Together. And it's a marvelous experience to be there together. Because we all see different things. Yeah, and, and when we're together, we should be encouraging one another to come up higher. To, to dare to believe, to, re to reach out uh, to him. And, and because it, if, we ever, if we ever really catch it, we become builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit, then, then we, become, we become the, the we're supposed to be, according to Acts 1.8, after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall become witnesses. Well, Okay, so we think, okay, great. I've, I mean, I've accepted Jesus. 
and the Holy Spirit, I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, and so now I should be, I should be a witness. R but really what it's saying is that that power comes on us to transform us and, and by the Spirit give us access to the Father so that as we go about our daily affairs, we are, a, a, the world can witness the presence of God in you and I. Hallelujah. Everywhere we go, we are a witness. See, when, when Moses went up on the mountain, he came back down, he was shining. When, when uh, uh, Jesus, the Mount of Transfiguration, right? He, he was, I mean, he was electrified. He was shining. He was brilliant. Like lightning flashes out of his clothing. I mean, it was phenomenal, right? And, and Moses had to put a veil on his face because people didn't, couldn't look at him. If we spend, spend time with God, guess what? We're going to glow. You're going to shine. This little, little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That, that's cute, but the, the reality is that it, as we spend time with him, his glory is going to be just oozing out everywhere, and people will witness it. You'll prosper. You'll flourish. You'll be healthy healthier than everybody else. You'll have more favor than anybody else. You'll always get the good parking place. Waiters and waitresses, will, they'll seat you in the best seats and take, get, get, you'll get the best waiters and waitresses. Everywhere you turn, you'll be favored, you'll be blessed. And people will look at that and they'll say, well, what, who are they? See, who are they? We need to understand whose we are. We understand, need to understand. You say, well, that, that's kind of, you know, you get all puffed up with pride. No, we know what it's all about. It's him. It's him. We've just spent a little time with him, and he rubbed off on us. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> now, you know that yeah. works the other way. It's who else you spend time with is going to yeah. rub off on you, too. Uh, you and I both know you go you go hang out in the wrong places with the wrong people and it just rub all over you. What's it say? Poor company corrupts morals, right? Or something along those lines. It just mm -hmm. you, it, you do. So you want to get around. You don't want to get around people that are using the F word all the time. I don't even like. I don't want to watch movies like that because I, I don't want that in my head. I want to. I want to hang around people that actually know how to speak English. And we'll say, I don't, want to, I don't want to hang around somebody that's always telling me what I cannot do and all the reasons why it won't happen. I want to be around somebody that's going to say, you know, you can do all things through Christ. Amen. Do you really believe that? Yeah, I really believe that. Hmm? Because it's true. I said it's true. So I want to get around somebody that knows God enough to tell me the truth. And the, and the truth is, what does God say? Glory to God. I like the part about God rubbing up on us. I like that part. So we're shining. We don't even know we're shining. Yeah. And, um, with the, for the, the glory of God is upon us every day of our lives. It's well, important what, for us to recognize that. What, what was the, in, in, the, in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, the, the life before the fall, the clothing that Adam and Eve had, was the glory. Yes, it was the Shekinah glory. The shine, mm -hmm. the shine, right? The glow, the right. fire, mm -hmm. the lightning. Right. Right. And, and that, all, that all came, that was their circulatory system, right? It was, right? And uh, when they fell, I mean, the life is still in the blood, but they saw they were naked. That glory garment was gone, which is, you saw it on Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. You saw it on Moses' face when he was with God, see? And we're still designed for that. And the more of God, the more we hang out with God, the more he rubs off on us, the more he has our life, the more, the more that glory is going to show. 
I, I've had experiences where people would just, I mean, they just, they want to know what's different about me. And I don't feel any different at all. Mm -hmm. Than anybody else, but it all you can say is, "Well, it must be Jesus." It just must be Jesus. You've experienced that, I know you have. You say people say, "I, I don't understand. How come you? I'm I'm really ticked off. How come you're just you seem to be at such peace? What's with that?" Well, it's just Jesus. Because <laughs> you're looking at things from the throne, from God's perspective, instead of looking at things from where everybody else is. Hmm? Well, if we get enough of that, I'll tell you what, we'll shine. I really believe that. We'll shine. People will see it. I know the devil sees it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, see, when, when the scripture says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. shed abroad is like turning on the light, right? <laughs> shed abroad. So, I mean, it kind of... Uh, it reflects out of us because we've been with the Lord. And uh, there's another place in the Bible that says that those who love his law are not easily insulted or upset or um, mm -hmm. uh, made angry uh, because they're going to love walk. Uh, things just don't bother them. They don't make things where there's not things. And even if there are things, it don't bother them anyway. Those things are going to go on and they'll pass away. But the love of God that is in Christ Jesus that's in us makes the difference, doesn't it? That does make a difference. I mean, so it's, it's just being exposed to him enough that he begins to be all that we focus on, all that we see. Everything that, that comes from us would be the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. And it's light and it's life to people. It's an exciting thing. I think it's exciting. Yeah, we, we know we have dominion of the atmosphere, the environment. We can change it in a minute. A soft answer turns away wrath. You can change it in a minute. Somebody really ticked off, really upset. If, if, you, can, if you can just get the, some gentle God words, that's the end of that. You just change the whole environment because we do have a do, dominion. We do have authority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we're to, we're to be witnesses of our relationship. It just, it's obvious. It's just obvious that we've been with the Lord. I mean, a bunch of dumb fishermen and people just marvel and say, wow, these guys are loaded. They are so smart. They must have been with Jesus. I mean, that was it. they knew they hadn't been to school. They were just dumb fishermen. All right? Now, I mean, dumb fishermen. They just weren't educated. They were good fishermen. They knew what they were doing. They knew the sea and they knew all of it. They knew their trade. But not, not the things they were talking about, not the things they were expressing. And so the, automatically people said, oh, those guys must have been with Jesus. Mm -hmm. that, that's the way we are. Oh, those guys must, they must, you must, you must be a Christian. Well, what makes you say that? Well, you're just so different. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you want to know any more? Oh, okay. Yeah. We're, we're supposed to demonstrate the result of this love relationship that, that manifests itself in our walk of faith. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Go ahead. When we have a relationship, we know a person would do certain things or not do certain things. So somebody can't come to you and say, well, so-and-so did this, and you say, well, no, they didn't, because that's not in their nature. I know them. They would never do that. So we have to make a decision then. Uh, do we really know that person? or right? Do we know the heart of that person? Uh, relationship brings us into the heart of God. Relationship brings us into the heart of other people to where we know people and we know how they think about certain things and things we know they would never do certain things. So if somebody were to accuse them of something that they thought they did, uh, that we wouldn't have any part of it. We wouldn't have any part of it at all. I mean, Sharon and I, 
were friends, you know, before we were really before we were lovers, we were friends before we got married. We and and even after that, we developed a friendship, and we knew each other. We we're very familiar with each other. And she was at, she was in a job, and this one he was a psychiatrist psychologist here in town. He accused her of being unfaithful. He he had the hots for her, and he was trying to. And she didn't want anything to do with him, you know. And, and so he decided he was going to destroy her. And they actually called me in and accused her of infidelity. And I looked at them, and I looked at her. I said, you got to be kidding me, man. I know my wife better than that. You must be talking around about the wrong girl. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. See, because that's not my wife. And it didn't even, it did not even enter my mind that it could have been true, because I know my wife. I know her character. I know. I just know the way she is. I know how much she loves me. Yeah. <laughs> See, and that that's real. But that's relationship. And so somebody can come and they can say, "Well, so and so said so and so about you," and you look at them and you go, <laughs> "You might be thinking of somebody else because I know them. They'd never say that." Right. It's relationship. It's a relationship. Yeah, it's a relationship. It's so important that we we do develop relationships that are that tight in God. Yeah, if we are offended, we can go back and say, did you really mean this or did I hear it wrong? Uh, uh, communication is, is important. But the same thing with God. How do we know God? By relationship. We have to listen to him, hear his word, be where his presence is, right? To spend time with him, to believe what he says, and recognize who he is. And then when somebody tells us that God is out to kill us, we know that's a lie. When the devil comes and says that uh, you didn't get saved, something happened, but you didn't get saved, that's, that's all a phony thing. You know better because you've learned to know the Lord. And you know what he says is true. And so when we put our faith in that, we build a relationship with God. Then we began to know, where, where do I stand in this? Well, I stand in heavenly places with Jesus. I've been elevated to a place where I see things differently. I have a different worldview. I have a Christian worldview. That is a whole lot different than a secular worldview. There's a big difference. I want to tell you, when you're in an airplane at 30,000 feet, your house looks different than when it does when you're on the driveway. Is that true? It looks different. Everything in the whole area looks different because you have a different perspective. And you can see the lay of the land and you can see what's going on. Well, when you're seated in the heavenly places with Jesus Christ and he's rubbing off on you and you look at certain things, you see them differently. Differently. And that's higher than 30,000 feet, my friends. Or is it? Maybe it's closer than we think, heavenly places. Mm. Jesus walked through the wall and came into to a room with them. Maybe it's closer than we think. Mm -hmm. Amen? But wherever we find ourselves with the Lord, if we will nurture that relationship, we will find that things will go much better for us in our life. We won't have to fight near as many battles. And we'll hear what he says. We won't know him. We know him because we see him after the flesh in the, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We know the Holy Spirit through the book of Acts. But when we get into the writings of Paul, we begin to understand the nature and the destiny and the love that God has for us. And it is way higher than what we saw him do on the earth. What he did on the earth, he did what the Father showed him, what he was supposed to do. He was totally obedient to his Father. But there was more to it than what we see when we look at him because we don't see the further purpose that God had in everything that Jesus did mm -hmm. we just don't and you know the Bible says that if all the things Jesus did were put in books the world wouldn't be big enough to hold that many books so what we're getting in the Bible God has given us those really important points that have a lot of authority and a lot of heavenly meaning to us 
that we might be able to perceive things uh, really that are not as though they were. We can see those heavenly things being brought to bear on the atmosphere that Jesus was in. As he walked through, he changed everything. And then the people that walked with him, when they walked through, what was it? Their shadows healed the sick. They took claws from, from Paul's body and took them to the sick, and they were healed because he was oozing out the, the life of God. The life of God is always creative. It's always redemptive, and the life of God is loving, and it is life. Zoe life, it brings life to us. It quickens our mortal bodies and brings us into a place where we are strong, like Caleb, right? Mm -hmm. 80, he's going to take the mountain. Oh, yeah, that's good, all right? Amen. At 80, he's going to take the mountain country, raise himself up a place for himself. At 80, don't think at 80 you have to quit conquering because in Christ we can do well, that's all good because it's getting closer. Maybe to you. <laughs> I am seated in heavenly places. There you go. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. But I, I found out, I found out something though. It, 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 see, I can I can get my I'm not I play to my, play guitar to my own amazement. All right. So, but it it's a it's a place where I like to just sit and sing to God and worship. I just worship God. And when I do that, I can hear him. I can catch glimpses of him. It's just other. It's awesome. Right? So, but when I lay the guitar down and go about my day, I can remember that and how close and how sweet it was, but it, it, it doesn't carry with me. Other than, you understand what I'm saying? I can take I can take and quiet myself if I can, and you know, for an A personality, it's difficult. But just to not do anything, just settle in with my Bible and with God, and I be, can begin to hear Him talk to me in my spirit. I just hear Him, or out of my heart, however that works. Just hear Him. And his presence is so close. I, I've been in meetings, crusades overseas, different things, where he is just so touchable, so real, so present. And yet I come back to the United States, I, I lose it. Don't it. In fact, to carry that off the platform, sometimes you do. After an anointed meeting, after some, you you go home and you you can't go to sleep because you're still you come. Mm -hmm, you, he's there with you. See. But what about the rest of the time? And we accept that because it, well, you're anointed behind the pulpit. The anointing comes and you become a different man. Amen. Glory to God. That that happens, you know, ministering in music or worshiping God or that, these various times, but. It's like you come and go. Why, why, why should we bother coming and going if we're already there, seated in Christ next to him? That's, what, that's kind of what I'm... See, I'm hungry to stay there all the time. To be there all the time. Is that possible? I believe so. Why shouldn't it be? Not, not that we're so, so, so just, you know mentally aware of it, but that it's just a place where we live. We're so used to being with him that he just, he does. Who is it out of it? Jesus is walking through the crowds, all kinds of people jostling him, bumping him, everything, and then one little lady touches the hem of his garment. His garment could have been a little piece of Paul's apron or anything because he was a tent maker. He probably had a work apron, you know. But anyway, it just could have been any piece of cloth. But she just touched. That's all she touched with just his garment. And he said, I felt virtue go out of me. Jesus. Jesus, yeah. But I said it could have been Paul. Oh, it, could have been. You know, it could have been Paul. It could have been his, uh, his cloth, too. 
I, I don't know what, what, who was it, Peter, the, what, who shadow? He, did, he, did he feel that virtue flow when his shadow touched people? I think so. Because there's a place where, in relationship, where we are. That that it's just, we're, we're walking we we're walking with him all the time, and his we can hear his voice. And, and when I'm with Sharon, she doesn't talk all the time. Thank God. But I listen when she does. But I'm aware of her presence. Glory. And we need to, I, th I, I believe God's calling his church and calling us as individuals to come into that place, to come up higher, if you will, or to come closer. You know, this morning it was closer, come closer, run closer, press in closer. He's calling us closer because he's going to demonstrate something that's never been demonstrated before. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. See, he redeemed us. God had a purpose and a plan for redeeming us, and that purpose, that eternal purpose, was, was to, to fulfill his eternal purpose concerning us, to, re, to, to, to involve us in the, in the business of redeeming the lost, of, of repairing broken humanity, of restoring the breach, of taking back dominion. And, and it's according to this eternal purpose. He purposed it in Christ. When we're in Christ, we enter his eternal purpose. Hallelujah. And, and he would that we, it, part of his eternal purpose is that we're rooted and grounded in God's love. That comes from a relationship with God to come to a place to where we realize God is not our father in the same sense our material, physical father was our father. He is totally other. He's holy, he's pure, he's perfect, he's loving, he's kind, he's merciful, he's long-suffering. He's entirely different. And to get develop that relationship to where we change our concepts of what it means to be father and to let him father us, grounded in his love, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, Ephesians 3.17, that we comprehend the mystery of God in Christ, Vision 3.18. He wants us to begin to comprehend with all the saints. Here we are together again with all the saints, all the saints. God's looking to bring us together so that we can unsound the depths and the heights and the breadth and the length to really begin to comprehend the love and the power of God. That's what we're trying to encourage you in today. Yeah. Encourage you in not losing your first love. Mm -hmm. To come back to that place where he becomes all in all. Where you have a, a presence of God in your life that, that you know, not just mentally that he's there, but you know that he is there. The word says that he is with us. I'll never leave you or forsake mm -hmm. you. There's a difference in that than rather than perceiving him riding in the seat next to you in the car. How we drive a little differently if we had Jesus in the front seat with us, wouldn't we? think maybe <laughs> you think maybe we'd talk different if we knew he was with us every minute uh, it's just something that it's a developmental thing it's just something calling us higher I, I'm with the uh, pastor I think God is trying to call us higher as a church to where we can really begin to be uh, in Christ and recognize what that really means and we hear it but our lives are not always showing that we're in Christ. And it shouldn't be a hard thing. To, you don't have to work hard at it. You just have to have a relationship. I don't have to work hard at being his wife after almost 52 years. It's just the relationship. <laughs> really. I was thinking about it today. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. Yes, it is. It is amazing. It is. And we've been walking with the Lord for 40 years. <laughs> That's amazing to me. It's amazing. And yet we need to know him more. We feel drawn to get to know him more. You never arrive at your destination in God. There's always more to be found. 
more to be explored and more uh, love, more power, more demonstration of God, although we don't follow him just for demonstration, but we follow him out of love because he first loved us, we love him, and yet he wants to bring us into so many things that uh, we may think we've apprehended something, but we haven't even got a hold of it enough to get a shock, <laughs> to get an infusion, amen? Uh, to feel the virtue flow in our lives. Amen. Yeah, through yeah. us to others. In Praise Ephesians the 3, Lord. 3, 19, the last part, it says to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. There's, there's an understanding of love that is outside of our knowledge, outside of our ability to know with the natural mind. It's only known by revelation supernaturally. And, and the reason he wants this to happen is so that he can fill us with the fullness of Christ. See, faith works by love. Everything that has to do with God works by love. You can move mountains, you can speak in tongues, you can prophesy, you can do all this stuff, 1 Corinthians 13. But if you don't have this agape, or agape love of God, if you don't have a revelation of that, the rest of it is, it just doesn't mean that much. Ephesians 3.19 in the last part says that the reason, the reason is so that you will be filled with the fullness of God. This is the goal of God. The manifestation of the fullness. That the church walks as a witness before people. They witness in you and I, in the church, the fullness of Jesus Christ. By this, you'll know they are Christian. The love they have for one another, it's not going to be natural love. It's not going to be brotherly love. It's not going to be familial love even. It's going to be this agape, unconditional God love thing that so unites us relationally that you cannot separate us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? See, there's no power that can do that. And so we, we need to move towards that. And, and once we begin to demonstrate the fullness, and the, I, see, we, we believe that the fullness of the Godhead is available in the church body. Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now he is the head. His body is us. And it's only because we're so fragmented that the fullness is not displayed for the world to see. And when the, when the world can see us begin to get healed and whole together as a body of Christ, whoo, <laughs> they won't talk bad about us anymore. Really, because they want, they'll des they desperately want what we are desperately seeking to have manifest in our lives. Hallelujah. Uh, another thing, too. Our, our Father wants us to be excellent in everything we do. Everything. Not pressured to be the best this or the best that or to get the best grades, but to be excellent. To rely on him, draw on him, do our part, study, you know, or whatever. But to be excellent in what we do. So why? So also we can be a walking witness. People, I mean, even in the body of Christ, we've got Christians complaining because some of our ministers are flying airplanes. They're living in too big a houses. They're driving too nice a car. Now, I understand there's abuses. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about the world looks at success. And they think, they think you have to be crooked. You have to cheat. You have to oppress people. You have to do all that. 
they've got a way of getting where they're getting, and it's on the backs of others. But they, these Christians who live a holy life, whose total, I mean, everything about them is to get the gospel to the world, and they're living good. The world looks at them and says, they either get violently angry, like some have, and try to bring them down, or they just begin to open doors for them because they see in them what they really want to have themselves, which is not just financial prosperity, but, but righteousness, peace, and joy to where you can enjoy what you have. That God wants, to, wants us to be a witness. That's why he wants us to prosper. Third John 2. Right? Third, one. third John. Is it chapter, there's only one chapter. Chapter 1, verse 2. I would that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. Why? So that it, the world looking at you and I can say, look at them. They're, hard, they're hardly ever sick. Even when they are, they, do, they, they don't go to bed and lay there for a week and pull the blinds and feel sorry for themselves. They always seem to rise above everything. They go into business, they're successful. But if they shake your hand, you know you've got a deal. They'll do what they say. I mean, we can change the world. We, we do have a, we, we are to be the witness, and God wants us to flourish, wants us to prosper, wants us to be able to say, Lot, take your pick, because it doesn't matter to me, because I'm walking in the blessing. I'm walking in covenant. God and I will go anywhere you leave us to go. Amen. So let your soul prosper in God. Amen. Yes, amen. Let him rub off amen. on you. Amen. Let him become all in all to you where things change. Your mind changes. Your 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 life changes. And it will as God rubs off on you. Yeah. Glory yeah. to God. What do we hear? Ruth Heflin. We we had a lot of her books and stuff and she's since passed away, but we, we heard somebody quoted her and she said what did she say? She said, you just go ahead and praise until you begin to worship. And worship until the presence comes. And that's really the key. And she was one of those. I mean, she, the Lord would say, go to China, and she she already had bags packed. I mean, she was, she'd go. And this is way back before Americans were allowed in China. She just go. You ever get a chance to read any of her books? They're absolutely amazing. But it's because she would praise till she worshiped, till the presence came, and then she would just stay in the presence until she got so comfortable with being with God in Christ that he could speak to her even in noisy rooms, distracting places, wherever, and she would just immediately recognize his voice and go and do. Hallelujah. That's where God wants us to be, wants us to go. That's where we're going. So that's where we're going. <laughs> that's where we're going. Hallelujah. Lifted up together in heavenly Yilababa places in Christ yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Are sitting at the Lord right hand of God the Father. Hallelujah. In heavenly places. Lord, we just thank you. We just thank you that you've given us this, that we have it as a present possession. And Lord, we pray that you'll bring this church into those heavenly places that each individual will learn to be with the presence of God in their lives and blessed and given favor because of it, because they will honor you and all that you've called them to do, Lord, will be just follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And we'll do what you, we see you do and we'll do what we hear you say. 
And for that, we give you the glory that you gave us the Holy Spirit today to bring us into that kind of a close relationship with you that we might be known as the children of God, led by the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. The, Amen. the, the, the Lord would say, this, this is your engraved invitation. This is your engraved invitation to come and sit in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, Amen. Personal Let's, invitation from God. Amen. Let's have communion. Huh? Okay. Praise the Lord. Uh, Luis is getting it. Yeah. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Good things ahead. Good things ahead. Hallelujah. I heard, uh, I think it was Bill Johnson, I heard him say, once God gives you an invitation to come to his, he throws a big party. It's like throwing, you know, somebody throws a big party in a mansion. And uh, you get an invitation, and so you come, you present it at the door, and of course that gives you access. You go in, there's, it's loaded with people, lots of people. You need to be careful that you don't get caught up in all the people and talking to all the people and forget to go and spend time with the host. He's the one that invited you. And he's over there. He's sitting in his chair. He's just waiting for you to come. He's going to invite you to sit down and talk. But if you never go over there and all you do is get caught up with the other people, you'll have missed why he invited you. Hallelujah, I thought. Thank you for being with us. We count it a privilege and a sacred trust to bring you the words of truth found in Scripture. It's our prayer that you've been strengthened and encouraged by this message, and it's our heart's desire that you come to know Jesus like never before and that you're drawn into the Word of God by the Spirit of the Lord working through these sermons. Other teaching CDs, DVDs, books, and brochures are available in our bookstore and media store, or you can purchase them on our website at wellspringministries.com. Our phone number is 702-631-5027. Give us a call if we can serve you in any way. We look forward to our next opportunity to be with you and share with you the wonderful, life-changing things of God. May God richly bless you as you pursue your high calling in Christ Jesus.